I'm going to talk about a pest today that generally we deal with uh, across the cotton belt, thrips, and whether we need to overspray or not. Generally, thrips is the first pest that we deal with out of the gate. I like to use that analogy because if you think about uh, the cotton growing season, it, it really is like a race if you think about it. We try to get seed in the ground as fast as we can, try to get it up out of the ground, and uh, get the cotton picked as soon as we can. So it is pretty much a race. And again, the thrips are the first pest that we have to deal with across the belt. And another thing that's unusual about thrips is the fact that while you have the Mid-South deals is really the only part of the whole belt across the country that deals with plant bugs, and then the guys out in the Southwest, they deal with, or Southeast rather, uh, deal with stink bugs. Uh, thrips is the one pest that we all deal with pretty much from, seems like from Texas all the way to Virginia. And if you don't have a good seed treatment or an at plant insecticide, otherwise such as, uh, such as an inferro, uh, your cotton may not look like this, it may end up looking like this. This is some cotton that we had at the Roar Station a couple of years ago that didn't have either a seed treatment uh, or any other kind of uh, at plant insecticide on it. <clears throat> Lo and behold, the cotton came up just fine. Uh, thrips jumped on it and it hit it pretty good. Needless to say, this cotton had uh, not only yield loss, but uh, also, uh, also maturity delay as well. Generally, seed treatments and even TAMIC, uh, when you look at data such as this, this is some of the trials. Uh, one of the trials that I had at Roar in 2008, uh, looking at uh, thrips uh, in cotton. And, and you can see here that with uh, the alcohol wash method, you get quite a few number of thrips uh, per five plants here. You get obviously more through alcohol washing than you do shaking off in your hand. And uh, But if you look here, you can see that under really good growing conditions and, and uh, ideal conditions, you can see that you get pretty good control across the board with the seed treatments and also the, uh, also the TEMIC as well. But sometimes it's not always that ideal. You can also get thrips jumping on seed treatments and even TEMIC at times. I've gone on some calls where even TEMIC had some damage, such as you see here. You see some of the silver leaf and some of the, um, you know, some of the issues here, that some of the leaf crinkling. And of course, again, that could cause, uh, could cause yield loss depending on the rest of the season. And of course, obviously, even if it's a seed treatment or TEMIC, you might have to go in and treat with a polymer insecticide. One of the big questions is, is what you know, insecticides do we have at our disposal? These are some of the uh, three old standbys here. And again, this is a trial I did back in 2008, uh, looking at untreated cotton seed at some of the uh, different foliage you can see here, and some of the standbys, orthene, bitern, and uh, methylate. They are pretty effective if you look at these and uh, you know across the board. But one thing to keep in mind is that these insecticides don't have a great deal of residual, and uh, if you uh, you know if you spray it and don't come back a week later and check it again, you might actually end up getting uh, more thrips coming in. So they're not very as long lived, but they are very effective. One of the questions that comes up is, well, when do I need to spray? When do I need to use these foliar insecticides? And these are uh, some of the threats, thresholds across the mid south here, and most of them are based on the number of thrips on five plants or per plant. Uh, or 10 plants even. A lot of folks just grab a bouquet of five or 10 plants and they knock it into some kind of a box and, or sometimes in their hand. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, one, one thing that we'll find is that thrips, uh, making management decisions on thrips is a lot of times not just a science, but it's also an art, uh, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But this is one way that some folks can make decisions. Some folks wait till a little bit of damage occurs. Uh, you can see here this plant thrips damage here in the terminal. I think I got this picture from Scott Stewart himself. And uh, some folks actually wait till they see this kind of damage before they decide to go and treat. And of course, I read last year in the Mid America Farmer Grower, uh, Scott Stewart actually uh, gave a recommendation. This is based mostly on experience, but it, uh, it is a good recommendation based on the experience that he has. Uh, if the leaf, if it uh, takes longer for the second true leaf, if it takes longer than 14 days after emergence before the first true leaf is vis visible, you might want to uh, consider an insecticide application. Also, when that first true leaf comes out, if you have damage and if you have thrips present, you might want to go ahead and treat there too. I did a survey last year of uh, the first 10 consultants that were on my phone that I could get a hold of. And uh, of all those 10 consultants, it represented about 30,000 acres, uh, most in southeast Arkansas, but we had one in southwest and one in northeast Arkansas. And uh, of all those acres, about 80% had seed treatments and 20% had TEMIC. And uh, most of them were sprayed at least once and some twice. One thing I do want to mention is some of the consultants that I do work with tend to lean more towards the IPM approach and try not to spray, uh, try to save sprays as much as possible. So it's maybe skewed a little bit on the load side. I know that some of it, a lot of it in some areas in South Arkansas gets uh, two applications. But the most important question of that survey in my mind was, what are the triggers? What, uh, what made you spray that insecticide 
over the seed treatments or over the timid. And some folks said that it was with the herbicide application, they were going across the acreage anyway, so just why not go ahead and drop the insecticide in just for convenience, because they don't want to come back a week later and treat again. Uh, some, some of them said when any thrips injury at all is evident anywhere on the plant. Uh, some said when there's injury only on the terminal, they might have injury on the, on the other leaves, but they just wait till they see that injury in the terminal. Uh, thrips and associated injury together was another trigger. Uh, some folks said when they just see thrips, they don't even want to wait for damage. And some folks said they don't spray until immatures only. And, uh, and of course, some use similar to Scott Stewart's recommendation, looking at the poor growing conditions and whether there's thrips and damage again, looking at just a different approach, a different factors uh, there for making that decision. Well, that begs the question, what about an automatic insecticide application? Just going out regardless, trying not to do any scouting, just going ahead and dropping it in and, and treating at a certain leaf stage. And this data were provided to me by uh, Scott Stewart also. He did this last year. Uh, you can see here, these are two separate trials, by the way, but you can see here in the untreated seed, it was actually sprayed twice, once at the second leaf stage and once at the four leaf stage. And you can see a $500 profit there based on that. And that's not really a surprise. We don't uh, recommend, I don't think, know if there's anybody that recommends going out with uh, untreated cotton at all, either without an inferral or without a seed treatment, just because of that uh, issue of thrips, it's more of a risk management issue there. Uh, but the gaucho, where this is imminent clover, uh, the same active ingredient that's an heiress, uh, here you can see that uh, it was sprayed only one time with acephate at that second true leaf, and you can see about a $90 uh, bump there and profit, although that is not a statistical difference there, so that wouldn't happen every time. But there, there's obviously something going on there uh, with that extra spray. So that begged a question for us a few years ago uh, when we were talking about uh, uh, trying to address this as far as automatic insecticide applications. When would be a good time for an automatic insecticide application over seed treatments particularly? Uh, first and second true leaf, that obviously sounds like a good one because it's early in the season. How about the third and fourth true leaf? Is that too late or would that help also? What about both? What about going out twice and making two, app two automatic applications? And, uh, or are they valuable at all? I mean, do we need them at all? So but again, based on that, uh, those questions there, we came up with what I call the Beltwide Thrips Project because in 2009 and 2010, we had 19 to 22 locations from Texas all the way to Virginia. Um, in the interest of time today, I'm gonna to talk about just 2011 which is mostly in the Mid-South. I have a map I'll show you in a second, but the main objective was to determine the value of automatic foliar insecticide applications sprayed at different stages over cotton, again, over seed treatments primarily, but also timid. This is just a quick snapshot of the locations that we had uh, for this study, most of them 2011, of course, again, in 20, 2009 and 2010, we had an extra one in Texas and several here in the Southeast, but for 2011, we had most of them here in the Mid-South. Well, the first data I wanted to talk about here was, uh, really quick, was the individual locations uh, that were not significantly different with respect to yield. That means including the untreated plots. Uh, the, co there's the cotton plots that had no insecticide whatsoever was not different at all from the other the plots that had insecticides. And that was actually five out of the nine locations that followed the protocol last year. And that already tells us something right there when five of the nine locations aren't significant for yield. They didn't have the thrips numbers or the cotton grew off really well and outran them even without insecticide. And this is just some of the data here. Uh, you see some different trends here, some variability issues with the Mississippi and Missouri location and a numerical difference there at rural Arkansas where, where we are. Uh, but, but for the most part, uh, you know, when you look at that, uh, this particular case, it tells you that when five out of nine uh, don't have uh, uh, any significant differences with yield, that almost tells you already that uh, automatic insecticide applications, foliar insecticide applications, may not be a good idea. But I wanted to tease apart a uh, some things apart over a couple of different uh, locations here. This is Don Cook, he's at Stoneville, Mississippi, and uh, Don's been working with thrips for a while, and he said that he had one of the most uh, showy uh, thrips trials that he's had in a long time, uh, where he had to plant a little bit later than the protocol suggested, about May 12th and uh, turned off where it got hot and dry, and I believe it wasn't irrigated cotton, so it had turned off where the plants were stressed pretty much all year. And I wanna set this slide up for you real quick on the, the x-axis here on the top line, uh, basically means the at plant. There's the untreated check. I broke these apart as into at plants. And the untreated check on the top means no seed treatment or timic. And over here, of course, is the timic. And in his trial, there was no significant difference in yield in the heiress plot, so that's why that's not up there. 
but you'll see the actual spray regimes here on the bottom here, the different, the different timings of the, the foliar insecticide, that quarter pound of acephate. First thing I want to point out is you can see a little bit of a trend here uh, with regards to yield and how the plants actually responded. The next thing to look at, oops, wrong way, there we go. The next thing I want to show you is the number of thrips for five, per five plants. Don had a pretty good number of thrips on five plants in this particular trial, so they jumped on them pretty good. This was the three day after the three to four leaf application, he had about 135 uh, thrips on five plants. That's quite, a, that's quite a bit there. And here also in the timid, you can see that it did a pretty good job. But the one thing I want to point out is that you had subtle differences in thrips numbers between these treatments. And, but you did have significant differences in the yield, uh, specifically here in this TEMIC. Where in contrast to that, and again, I want to point out that Don's uh, plots were really stressed throughout the whole season. But here are some pictures, uh, early season, uh, where you can see these are some of the plots that had uh, no seed treatment whatsoever, no insecticide. You can see this is why uh, he had some uh, yield differences here. Here's another picture here. Uh, one, a couple of the plots here, they just got jumped on pretty hard. So not only does that show that for the purpose of the data, but it also shows that if we were ever to try uh, growing cotton without a seed treatment, we had some consultants in my area that had six or 700 acres without a seed treatment and it wasn't pretty. He said they had to spray it three or four times. And so obviously we don't want to go that route. In contrast to Don Cook's cotton in Mississippi that was really stressed, uh, just right up the road here, about an hour, Jackson, Tennessee, Scott Stewart's plots, he said that he had about the best looking thrips trial he's had in terms of actual yield. He said it's the best cotton he's had in a long time. If you do the math here, he's, getting, he's bumping probably close to four bales here. The first thing I want to point out is all of the treatments that any, had any kind of insecticide whatsoever were significantly better than the cotton that didn't have an insecticide. So. Uh, that's a pretty, uh, pretty important observation there. But another thing is if you look within each of the at plants, within Eris, within Temic, uh, you can see that there's not really even a trend as far as the insecticide applications there. So, and when you look at his thrips numbers, you can see that he has significantly more uh, variability in his thrips numbers. But I think what happened here, he had a lot of variability in his thrips numbers, greater differences than Don did, but because his cotton grew so well for the whole length of the season, I think his cotton could uh, his cotton uh, crop could compensate much better in each of those plots and and, and help to compensate for that uh, those numbers of thrips. So, uh, in summary of this project, the automatic schedule foliar applications are not really a viable recommendation. I'm not saying you can't do it or shouldn't do it all the time, but uh, as far as a blanket recommendation, we just don't feel comfortable saying yes. You could spray it first leaf and then come back and spray it third leaf every time. Again, it's more of an art. It's an art and a science together. There's so many different things that come into play. Again, it may not be economical, but more importantly, you go in and make automatic applications. If you have to be in an area that has spider mites, aphids, you know, things like that, uh, you know, you could easily flare those pests. Uh, if you have healthy cotton, it's going to be in good shape and probably over, probably compensate for that injury. Uh, if you have stressed cotton, though, you obviously want to look at it a little bit closer, and you may have to make an application. Uh, when are some potential needs for applications? Again, you have to have thrips. I mean, that's what you're spraying for. That's really the only pest that, that uh, you're probably going to be spraying for that time of the year. Uh, if you decide to go no at plant insecticide, if you try to get non seed treated cotton, which I don't recommend, uh, you better get ready to budget at least a couple of three uh, insecticide applications or at least be ready to. Uh, early planting, we try to plant as fast as we can so we can get the season done if we can. But again, that's uh, kind of dangerous. We know that if it turns off cool and wet, uh, that can be trouble because that cotton will stop growing. Thrips can jump on it. The plant won't be able to outrun it. So that's another important point. Herbicide injury. Uh, that's another thing that could happen. Now, I'm not going to talk. try to talk about what insecticides can injure your cotton. But obviously, if your uh, cotton is injured, it can't get up to that fourth or fifth leaf stage for a while. That's another thing that could slow it down significantly, too. Uh, poor vigor, if there's a variety that has naturally poor vigor right up front, or a combination of any of these, obviously. So we want to make sure we look at that. So, so the big question is, what's the best thing to put in the field for thrips? It's hard to see up on these screens, but there's one right here, there's one there, and there's another one too, and the answer is footprints again. And I'm not sure if we'll ever have a technology that will completely absolve us from, from having to uh, scout. Uh, and so scouting is very important. Uh, even with these new technologies coming on seed treatments. And again, that's very, very important. Again, because of the different growing conditions that you could get and because we simply don't want to make uh, automatic insecticide applications.